I'm sure that most people doing this course will already have a basic understanding of coronary anatomy. It isn't sensible, however, to begin taking you through an in-depth discussion regarding individual coronary arteries and their branches without you first having a basic understanding of the overall structure of the coronary circulation. This chapter is really just a brief recap of the coronary circulation before we go into things in greater detail. It's really important to recognize that when you're looking at a coronary angiogram, what you're actually looking at is the filling of the lumen of the coronary arteries by contrast medium and not the actual artery or the arterial wall themselves. A coronary angiogram is probably more accurately referred to therefore as a luminogram and therefore has limitations. It's also important to recognize that whilst coronary angiography remains the gold standard test for coronary anatomy, it also has its limitations. These limitations primarily have to do with image resolution, insofar as only vessels over a certain size can be seen. The microcirculation, which you can't see, makes up a huge proportion of the myocardium's blood supply, and it's actually functionally very important. It's important not to forget that the microcirculation exists, even if it's not seen on a coronary angiogram. It's fundamental in understanding a number of invasive functional assessments that are performed in the cath lab, and can explain a number of phenomena that you might see, including myocardial blush and acute no reflow, for example. In this chapter, we'll demonstrate this with a real case example. So why don't we start by refreshing our memory about basic coronary anatomy. You'll recall that in the majority of patients, there's both a left and a right coronary artery. There are obviously some variations to this and some specific congenital abnormalities, which may be discussed in a later chapter or course. The coronary arteries originate from the aortic root just above the level of the aortic valve, in the sinuses of Valsalva. Let's have a look at that area in more detail. Ordinarily, the left coronary artery originates in the left sinus of Valsalva. The right coronary artery in the right coronary sinus of Valsalva. And there isn't a coronary artery associated with the third coronary sinus of Valsalva, and so it's often known as the non-coronary sinus. The cusps of a normal aortic valve are similarly named in accordance with which coronary artery they're associated with. And you may have already come across this when studying the aortic valve in more detail or during an imaging or echo course. Here in the slide, you can see a picture of the coronary arteries arising from the aorta and their respective courses. Obviously, there's going to be some variation in this between individual subjects. So let's start by discussing the left coronary artery first. From the aorta, it originates as a vessel known as the left main stem. This divides, or bifurcates, to form the left anterior descending artery, or LAD. We sometimes refer to this as the left interventricular artery. It runs in the interventricular sulcus between the left and the right ventricles on the anterior surface of the heart. The circumflex artery shown here is the other branch off the left main stem. It goes around the heart in the atrioventricular groove. The right coronary artery is a separate vessel from the left coronary artery. It takes an entirely separate course and it predominantly supplies the right ventricle and often the blood supply to the sinus and the atrioventricular or AV node. It commonly gives rise to the posterior interventricular artery or the posterior descending artery known as the PDA. We'll talk about all of this in more detail when we review the coronary arteries in turn, so don't worry too much about it at this stage. As you can appreciate from the diagrams, the coronary arteries are actually situated on the surface of the heart, which we'd call epicardially. They're located directly under the pericardium. These epicardial vessels are the arteries we're studying on a coronary angiogram. 
they perforate deep into the myocardium towards the endocardium, where they branch into a huge network of perforator arteries, arterioles, and ultimately capillaries. This huge vascular bed is often referred to as the microcirculation. It can't be appreciated on a coronary angiogram because these vessels tend to be less than 300 microns in diameter and below the spatial image resolution of a coronary angiogram. Let's just have a little look at that in more detail. As we've said, these are the epicardial arteries. They branch into perforator branches, arterioles, and capillaries. Broadly speaking, these main epicardial arteries are also referred to as epicardial conduits. The rest of the small vessels, and particularly those vessels less than 300 microns in diameter, are known as the microvasculature. In this anatomical cast of a coronary circulation, it's possible to identify just how extensive this network is. And one can hopefully appreciate that on a coronary angiogram, the epicardial coronary vessels and their main branches are only just a small part of the entire coronary circulation. Although they are very important, it's sensible to start thinking of these epicardial vessels as just tubes or conduits to allow blood to reach the microcirculation from the aorta. Recognition of the microvascular component of the coronary circulation is extremely important, as it makes up the greatest proportion of myocardial blood supply. For any of you who have used vasodilator stress agents, such as adenosine, for myocardial perfusion scanning or in nuclear medicine or cardiac MRI, etc., it's predominantly this microcirculation which is being vasodilated by such agents and not the epicardial vessels. The microvasculature is also pivotal in understanding how the functional importance of a lesion can be determined using measurements such as fractional flow reserve, or FFR, following an invasive pressure wire assessment. We'll discuss this concept and some measurement techniques that are used in subsequent courses. The other reason for considering the coronary microcirculation is to understand the concept of acute no reflow or slow flow, which is sometimes seen following a PCI. This can be seen in any PCI case, although it's often more prevalent in acute coronary syndrome cases where there's an increased burden of intracoronary thrombosis. It's best to try and illustrate this concept with a real case, and we'll present this in the next lesson.